chapter 1 Joel chapter 1 I'm going to read the whole chapter is that alright because cause there's some good stuff up in here Joel chapter 1 the word of the Lord that came to Joel the son of Pethuel hear ye this or hear this ye old men and give ear all ye inhabitants of the land hath this been in our days or, or your days or even as the days of your father tell your children of it let your children tell their children and their children another generation. That which the pommel worm hath left, the locust eaten, and that which the locust have left, the canker worm eaten, and that which the canker worm hath left, the caterpillar eaten. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come upon my land strong without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He had laid my vine waste and barked my fig tree and made it clean bare, cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Lament like a virgin girt with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourns for the corn is wasted. The new wine dried up. The oil languishes. Be ashamed. Oh, you husbandmen. Ouch. Be ashamed, you caretakers, and howl, you vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, and the pomegranate tree, the palm tree, the apple tree, even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament. You priests, how you ministers of the altar, come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God, for the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. Sanctify a fast call assembly or a solemn assembly. Gather the elders, all the inhabitants of the land of the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord. Alas for the day, the day of the Lord is at hand. And as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. Is not the meat cut off from before your eyes? Yes, joy and gladness from the house of your God. The seed is rotten under the clod. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? Herds of the cattle are perplexed because they have no pasture. Yes, the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O oh Lord, to you will I cry. For the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness and the flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry also unto you, for the rivers of water are dried up, and the fire has devoured the pastures of the wilderness. This morning I want to talk to you about serious survival strategies. Serious survival strategies. Strategies, Father, add your blessing upon your word. Anoint the hearts, ears, minds, and spirit of your people to hear. Anoint my lips, tongues, tongue and lungs, Lord, my voice, that I can preach what you have laid upon my spirit to preach. Lord, do not let me be within myself. Let me preach under the unction and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Let it be like fire as it finds the mark of every heart in this building. And it's in Jesus' name. And somebody ought to shout amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. On the National Geographic channel from 2011 to 2014, there was a reality TV show. You remember reality shows? They like took over television. I mean, every channel like, Always had some kind of reality show. I mean, they even got some crazy stuff like Naked and Afraid. I mean, who wants to watch that? I mean, some crazy stuff. One of my favorites is the Ultimate Cowboy Showdown. I bet y'all never guessed that, right? Some crazy stuff, reality, because they said they want to show the reality of what's going on in these people's lives. Yeah, right. Probably about as much reality as if. 
I'm sure most of it is scripted. But nonetheless, they say they are reality shows. One such show on the National Geographic Channel ran from 2011 to 2014 was called Doomsday Preppers. Y'all remember seeing that? Doomsday Preppers. And it profiled various survivalists or preppers, if you will, who were preparing to survive various circumstances that caused the end of civilization as we know it. Maybe economic collapse or societal collapse or electromagnetic pulse or some other such that they said could possibly come upon uh, the land and cause us to see the end of civilization. Now they were graded in this reality show. They were graded by a company on their preparation for the upcoming catastrophe, whatever that catastrophe may be. And at the end of the show or the end of the season, one team or one family or one person or whatever it would be, one doomsday prepper would win the prize because they were graded above everybody else for their amount and level of preparation for the upcoming quote unquote catastrophe or destruction. And everybody flocked to the TV and everybody began to look. And the premise uh, to many seemed to be very far fetched and, and, and maybe even a little ridiculous. And a lot of people watched it probably just to get a good laugh. Because you got folk running around with gas masks on and they stocking up root cellars and bunkers and concrete bunkers and stuff and they putting food and water and, and they going through all these plans and routines and, and ever, getting everything down and, and practicing for the end of civilization. And a lot of people watched it not to learn something or not really even because it, it, it appealed to their mm, entertainment itch. They, they watched it to get a good laugh because many of them said, this is all so ridiculous that it's funny. And so it became more of a comedy show to some people because they did not believe that anything like this would ever happen in America. Too far-fetched, they said. Too extreme, they said. However, history has taught us time and time again that the end of civilization could be just a generation away. Could be just in a moment of time if certain things were to line up, if certain elements were to line up or certain dominoes were to fall, if so to speak, that the end of civilization as we know it could very well be upon us. History has taught us that it is always better to be prepared. It's sort of like owning a gun. It's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. I don't hear nobody saying nothing. I like gun control. I control it with my hands. And so we've learned that it's best to be prepared because preparation is the key to success, but preparation is also the key to, uh, to survival. Uh, is it possible to survive the end of civilization if one is not prepared? It may be possible, but it is remote possibility. But if there was a doomsday prepper, I'm going to get a lot of backlash on this one, I can tell. If there's a doomsday prepper that's got his bunker full and he got all of his supplies stocked up, who do you think would be better prepared? Who do you think would be a better survivor should the worst come upon us? Because preparation is not only the key to success, but it's the key to survival. Watch this. Let me see if I can break it down to you in terms that possibly you would understand. How would you feel if you purchase your airline ticket and you walked into the airport and you stood in line to get your seat and you loaded up a plane 
And the pilot walks on the plane, and he gets down in the cockpit, and he fires the engine up, and he taxis out to the runway. And as he's taxiing out, he tells you, um, I didn't really have time to go through the whole pilot course thing. So, I, you know, I, I kind of I quit like halfway into it, but they gave me this job anyway. Y'all be cool with that, right? Or perhaps you're on a cruise ship, like, you know, with 750 passengers or 1,527 passengers and the captain of the cruise ship and the crew of the vessel. Well, we didn't really have time to go through the proper maintenance procedures on the ship, and we don't really know if it's going to sink or not, but we're going to take our best shot and hope for the best. You'll be okay with that, right? It's doubtful. And so why would you take the risk? Because it's always better to be prepared than to be unprepared. Am I talking to anybody? How about if you're on a roller coaster? Some, somebody said, I ain't even going on there if they are prepared. I don't care what they do. But my point is, the unexpected is always lurking nearby. That catastrophe, that destructive force, that thing that could take you out and end it all is always lurking in the shadows. And the truth of the matter is that most of us go through life as unprepared as a pilot who went through half of his pilot training. We go through life never expecting that it will ever happen to us. That's that other guy. Oh, I feel sorry for old Joe over there that that jack fell and the car fell on top of him and crushed his sternum. I feel sorry for him, but it ain't never going to happen to me. And so I crawl up under my car anyway without taking the proper precaution because, you know, I'm too young. It's not going to happen to me. And so we just kind of mosey through life as unprepared as we can be. While death and destruction is always lurking in the shadows, in the corners, just waiting to pounce at an opportune moment. And yet we go through life with blinders on, unprepared, not ready, because we never expect the unexpected. Here's what God said through the prophet Joel in our text. He said, you tell the people the attack is coming. He said, tell the people. I want you to tell them that the attack is imminent. I want you to tell them this is not a maybe so. This is not a think so. The attack is coming. There is an enemy that's about to invade your shores that you cannot escape. You're going to have to deal with it. Tell the people this is not some doomsday prepper scheme or reality show or none of that. St this is for real. This thing is going to happen. Happen, Joel, tell the people to get ready to prepare, to prep, if you will, because this thing is going to happen. There's going to come, and I'm not going to take the time because I've already preached it to you about the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust, the caterpillar, how that there's this attack that's coming upon the shores of your land, and you cannot escape it, you cannot avoid it, you can't get away from it. So the best thing you can do is be for it. Comes, he said, because it is coming. After the locust, he said, there's going to be a lion. It's going to be like a lion with the cheek teeth of a great lion that's going to come up on the land. Watch this. In verse number seven, he said, and the vine is going to be wasted and the fig tree is going to be stripped bare. Everything that you depend upon is going to be taken away from you. Everything that has been your sustaining force is going to be stripped and ripped away from you. Everything that you thought was going to be your, your store, your stash, that thing to get you by. He said the enemy is coming to take it 
all away from you. Get ready because it's coming. I need to make an announcement. If you haven't felt the attack of the enemy on your life as of yet, it's coming. If you are a child of God, and especially if you wanted that tongue-talking crowd, the enemy already has a target painted on your back, and the attack is imminent. You don't escape. You don't get away. It is going to happen. It's coming on your shore. The only thing that you can do is be ready and be prepared for the attack when, it's com when it comes because it will hit your land. He said, I'm going to take away the vine, which means I'm going to take away everything that you thought that was going to sustain you. I'm going to strip your fig tree. Watch this. This is interesting and I'm not going to take time because I took a lot of time beforehand, but I'm going to take a lot of time. I'm going to bring this out to you. The fig tree, watch this, was a staple in the lives of the Israeli people. A staple. Figs, dates, they are a staple in the lives of the Hebrew people. And he said very pointedly, very specifically, he said when he comes, this enemy me. He's going to strip the bark off of your fig tree. He's going to strip it off. Watch this. That bark is a protective covering. That bark keeps the inner core of that tree intact and healthy. And once the bark is gone, it leaves it, watch me, exposed to the elements. It leaves it exposed to anything and everything that would come and do damage to the tree. He said when he comes, the enemy is going to strip your bark and leave you exposed to everything and anything that wants to come and take a lick at you. They, they, they're they going to come and they're going to do whatever they want to do because now you have no covering. Now you have no bark. You have no protection. You have nothing to withstand the attack. Watch this. That bark was a protective covering for the inner core of that tree. Watch it. And you could take something and throw it at that tree, but it just bounced right off the bark. The bark may have some nicks and cuts in it. The bark may be bruised and wounded, but watch this. The bark can take it. I ain't hearing nobody. But it's the inner part of that tree, that life-giving, sustaining force on the inside of that tree that the bark says I have to protect this at all costs. See that's what a covering will do for you. I need to talk to somebody. That's what a covering will do for you. You need to get yourself up under a covering because that covering will protect you. That covering will ward off stuff that tries to take you out. That covering will ward off attacks from your adversary that have come to drain you and, and, and suck the life out of you and harm you and hurt you but thank God there's a bark thank God there's a covering thank God that we can come up under a covering and know that the enemy's coming but as long as we got our bark as long as we are protected as long as the covering is there we're going to watch this but he said when the enemy comes he's going to strip the bark and it's going to leave you exposed when you're exposed, you're naked. Everybody can see whatever thing you got. And they see your birthday suit. And when the enemy can see your spiritual birthday suit, are y'all hearing me? Then you are open prey and open game to the enemy. Watch this. There's another thing the bark does. Not only does it protect you, but watch this. It gives you an identity. Oh, oh, let me help you. Y'all still quiet, but it's okay. It gives you an identity. Watch this. When I had a, I had a course in school that was called Natural Resources. And in natural resources, we went out into the woods. We went out into the forest in the wilderness. And, 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 and the teacher would take us out there and he'd put blindfolds on us. And he would tell us, he'd, say, he'd take our hands and he'd put it on the tree. And he'd say, tell me what kind of tree that is. Most people can't do that, but people that have been, that have studied those trees and that bark, they can feel that bark and they can tell what kind of tree that is simply by the bark. Are you with me? Because a sycamore tree has a certain type of bark. An aspen tree has a slick, smooth bark, but an oak tree has a rough bark. A pine tree has a flaky bark. Are y'all with me? And so you can tell by the feel of it. Why? Because that bark gives it its identity. Let me help you. So God said, tell the people when the enemy comes, 
When the enemy comes, if they are not prepared, here's what's going to happen. He's going to strip the fig tree both of its covering and its identity. Oh, I need to help somebody. Y'all ain't shouting, but I'm going to preach anyhow. I'm going to have that. They're going to be able to strip you of your covering, which is your protection, your guard, and your identity. So watch it. So now we got a lot of church folk that are walking around. They ain't got no covering. And because they don't have any covering, they have lost their identity. Oh, let me talk to somebody that can hear me. There's an identity crisis that's happening in the body of Christ. And we're wandering through life and not, we're wandering and wondering. We're wandering through life and wondering who we are. Because the enemy has come in and stripped us of our bark. And now we don't have a covering. And now we're exposed. But on top of that, we don't even have an identity. And not only do we not know who we are, but nobody else knows who we are. Because we used to be this because we used to have a bark. Let me talk to you. Let me talk to you in terms you can understand. We used to be Pentecostal and everybody knew it because we had the bark. But we've allowed the enemy to come in because we were not preppers. We allowed the enemy to come in because we're not prepared. And he stripped our bark from us. And now we're exposed and unprotected. And on top of it, we're walking around with no identity. Going through an identity crisis because the enemy has stripped us of everything we thought we were. So now nobody knows whether you were a Pentecostal church or not. Because we don't operate in the gifts of the Spirit. We don't praise. We don't shout. We don't lay hands on the sick. Oh, y'all didn't want to come today, did you? Maybe I should have gave you the day off. We don't pray in the Holy Ghost. Heck, we don't even pray at all. And we preach some little mealy mouth sermon behind the pulpit that we downloaded off the internet. We don't spend any time in the throne room trying to get a download from God. Rather, we go 15 minutes before church and download some warmed over sermon that some little mealy mouth limp wristed preacher preached to his little dead church. And now we preach that and give them a little spiritual pablum and send them home and think they're going to be okay. And what has happened is we have allowed the enemy because we're not spiritual preppers. We've allowed the the enemy to strip us and now we have no identity we don't look like who we're supposed to look like we don't talk like who we're supposed to. I'm preaching better than you're shouting but it's okay we don't talk like who we're supposed to talk like we don't worship who we're supposed to worship we don't do what we're supposed to do we don't win souls anymore we don't lay hands on the sick anymore we don't speak in tongues anymore and yet we still want to talk about we Pentecostal no you are dead dried up twice dead and Locked up by the roots. Because you ain't got no bark. And I don't know I can tell who you are. Well, I thought they were Pentecostal, but see, preaching like this is good to run folk off. I told Pastor Tyree, I told the church when I was preaching about it last week, I said I heard somebody talk about their pastor getting all these speaking engagements everywhere. And they said, he said, well, well, we're glad. We're glad that, you know, he's qualified to go do this. We're glad that people, he's in high demand. I said, well, you're looking at one that ain't in high demand. They don't want me to come preach. Ain't nobody want me to come preach. But it's cool. It's okay. I'm not in hot demand because this preaching run folk off instead of getting to me and y'all. Listen, you lost your bark. Watch. And then in verse 10, he said, and the corn, the wine, and the oil was destroyed. Watch this. Man is made with three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Corn, wine, oil. The corn is the body. The wine is the soul. And the oil is the spirit. He said, watch, so he's not only going to attack your identity, he's going to attack the core of who you are. All three parts. He's going to attack your body, he's going to attack your soul, and he's going to attack your spirit. 
He's coming after you. Make no mistake, the enemy is coming. Make no mistake, the end is coming. Make no mistake, the catastrophe. You better start prepping because the catastrophe is coming your way. You do not get to get out of it. It's coming your way. And he's coming after not only your body, not only your soul, but your spirit. He's coming after all three parts of who you are. The corn, the oil, and the wine. Are you still with me? Watch this. And the problem is... The problem is that the church, for the most part, after God tells us to prep, after the signs are pointed out to us, after everything is illuminated to us, we still don't do anything. And then when the attack comes, what happened? I lost my corn, I lost my wine, my oil, my fig trees, barked, stripped, everything's gone. And I never saw it coming. No, the preacher been preaching to you for 25 years, but you didn't see it coming. Grandma been telling you ever since you were a baby bouncing on her knee, but you didn't see it coming. The word of God has been on your coffee table. But you don't ever pick it up so you didn't see it coming. Hello, somebody. We got technology. You can tap into YouTube and everything else and watch people preaching all over the Internet. But you didn't know it was coming. You didn't know it was coming because you didn't want it to come. And you didn't think it would ever come on you. So God said, Here's what's going to happen. He said, the reason that you didn't see it coming, watch this, verse number five. Watch, awake, you drunkards. That's it. You weren't ready because you were drunk. You weren't ready because you were intoxicated. Listen, I ain't just talking about a fifth of Jim Beam. You were intoxicated by the things of this world. You were intoxicated by the, the, the hope of riches. You were intoxicated by the hope of fame and fortune. You were intoxicated by that little split tail girl. You were intoxicated by that big old... Man, you were intoxicated by all of these other things. You, you were drunk on the things of this life and the things of this world. Watch it. And when you are drunk, you don't see clearly. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll go on the street corner and preach. When you're drunk, you, have, you do not have the ability to see clear. Everything is blurry. Everything is hazy. And you don't see clearly. In other words, your vision has been messed with. Watch this. Not only that, but you've got a slow reaction time. So when something does happen, you don't react fast enough. And because of it, you find yourself in a mess because you were intoxicated. Oh, I wish I had half a church to preach to. We got a bunch of drunk Christians who are intoxicated with everything else except the Holy Ghost. Paul said, don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be drunk in the Spirit. We've gotten drunk with everything but the Spirit. And because of it, our reaction time has been slowed. Our vision has become blurry. And we don't see like we're supposed to see. And so now we're stumbling and fumbling our way through life and bumping into everything because we are drunk. When you're drunk, you're oblivious to everything. Not only is your vision blurry, not only do you have slow reaction time, but you're oblivious to stuff. Stuff be happening right in front of you and you never know it because you're intoxicated. Listen to me. Signs. I didn't see that stop sign, officer. No, I'm sure you didn't. Because you were oblivious to it. Hmm? Are you hearing me? Every season has signs. Remember that? Remember that? 
God will give you a sign when there's a season change. If you miss it, it's because you're oblivious to it. If you miss it, maybe it's because you've been drunk and intoxicated on everything else but him. If you're oblivious to it, if you've got deficits in your life of drunkenness and intoxication, maybe it's because you were so oblivious to what was really happening in front of you that you just plowed through anyway. You just did it anyway. You just went on ahead anyway and were oblivious to everything that God was trying to tell you. And when you wake up and sober up a little bit, then you're going to cry the blues and wonder why all this happened to you. And God said, I tried to show you time and time again but you were so drunk that you were oblivious inebriated on the things of this world you cannot prepare properly when you are intoxicated And God said, your problem is you're going to miss it because you're drunk. I'm talking to the church right now. You're going to miss it because you're intoxicated. You're going to miss it because you're inebriated and you're oblivious to everything. You know why the church is behind every other entity in the world at reacting to natural disasters and everything else because they're drunk. Slows your reaction time. It blurs your vision. And the church is walking around in a haze. The church is walking around in an alcoholic, intoxicated haze because we have gotten so drunk on the things of this world. Y'all ain't here. I, I don't know. Y'all, y'all just sitting there like bumps on a log, but that's okay. I'm going to preach it anyhow. We have become so intoxicated. I'm talking about the church has become so intoxicated with everything but God, everything but his presence, everything but his spirit, and now we wonder why all of this is happening in America today. We wonder why everything thing is topsy-turvy and upside down it's because you have sat in a stupor you have sat in your stupefaction and sat there and gotten drunk and passed out on God until everything happened that he said was going to happen but you didn't see it so what do you do how do we combat? How do we survive the unsurvivable? How do we survive unstable and uncertain times? How do we survive? If we do see the sign, what do we do to prep? If we hear the voice of God, how do we become that prepper? It's right here. It's all right here. You ready? The first thing you do, he says in verse number 13, gird yourselves. Mm. Gird yourselves. Watch this. Mm. Let me me read a little bit further. Gird yourselves and lament you priests, leadership. Gird yourselves and lament you ministers of the altar. Come and lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God. For the meat offering and the drink offering is withholding from the house of your God. Gird yourselves. Peter says it this way. He said, gird up the loins of your mind. Buckle up. Watch this. When he said, it's key here that he said priest. He said, because right now I'm talking to the priest. Because as the leadership goes, the rest of the church goes. That's a word for y'all leaders. If the fire is dying within the congregation, is it possible it's because the fire is dying within the leadership? Y'all pull your toes in a little bit if you need to. Is it possible that the congregation has no hunger because the leadership has no hunger? Is it possible that the congregation doesn't care because their leadership doesn't care? Right. 
Let me tell you something, leaders. You are an example. You have to raise the bar. And I don't want to hear no complaining about that ain't fair. I don't care whether it's fair or not, leader. You better raise the bar. If you're leadership in this house, you better raise the bar. You better be an example and lift the bar a little bit higher because people are looking at you. What do you mean? That means you better act right. You better talk right. You better do right. Hello, somebody. You better do everything that you are supposed to do. If you have any, if you have any questions about what a real leader is to do, I don't know how you could have missed it in five years, but I'll sit down with you and explain it to you again. You better raise the bar a little bit higher, leader, because everybody else is looking at you. He said, gird up, gird yourselves. The priests wore an ephod. Recognizable, the bark. The priests wore an ephod upon which all of the other things that he ministered to the people through the sacrifice. I've already preached this. You ought to, this, is, this, is, this is refresher course. All the other things, all the things that he used to minister to the people in the sacrificial system, he would hang from his ephod. Watch. But what kept the ephod together was the belt. And he girded the ephod with that belt and buckled it. Here's what, here's what Ephesians 6 and 14 said. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, gird yourself with the belt of truth. Put the belt of truth on because watch me because it's truth that holds everything else together. It's truth that holds the ephod on. It's truth that holds your life together. It's truth that holds your salvation together. It's truth that holds your leadership position together. It's truth that holds the word together. It's truth that holds everything together. So if you don't gird yourself with truth and prepare yourself, I'm trying to give you a serious survival strategy. If you want to make it when the crash happens, if you want to make it when the end comes, if you want to make it when everything falls apart, number one, you better gird yourself up. You better get truth gird about your loins. You better gird the loins of your mind and you better make sure, leader, that everything is in place and everything is in order in your life before you try to tell anybody else what to do. Gird yourself. So you know what it tells me? The implication is that we had priests running around here trying to wear the ephod with no belt. I don't know. I know sometimes you feel like you're preaching pretty good, but then the response that you get is like, hmm, I don't know. If I were to put on a pair of 38 in the waist pants and no belt, my britches would fall off of me because I don't wear a 38. Are y'all with me? But even if they're too big for me, if I put a belt on, it may look funny, but it'll still hold them up. Hello, somebody. Are y'all with me? So we have here evidently priests walking around with ephods on, flapping in the breeze because they refuse to put a belt on. Are y'all with me? You know why? Because belts can be a little uncomfortable. No, y'all didn't hear me. I said the belt of truth can be a little uncomfortable. Uh, see, see, belts of truth tend to cut a little bit. When you tighten up the truth, it tends to hurt a little bit and make you a little uncomfortable. So most of us pull our belt off and our britches are falling down because we don't want to be uncomfortable. He said, gird yourself. Get yourself together, boy. You got an entire congregation of Israel looking at you. What are you doing walking around with stuff exposed and stuff flapping in the breeze? Put your belt on. 
And the belt of lies will break. You need the belt of truth. I don't know. I'm preaching. I'm preaching. Watch this. In Ephesians 6, he said, having your loins girt about with truth. Watch this. The loins are your birthing place. The loins are your seed bed. Hello? For a man, the loin is your seed bed. For a woman, the loin is your birthing place. And when the seed is deposited in the birthing place, hello somebody, then something comes to life. So he said, you better gird up your seed bed. You better gird up your birthing place because that's where purpose is born. That, mm, that's where vision is born. That, that, no, no, no. That's where anointing is birth. That's where destiny comes forth. And you better gird up and you better put the truth around your loins because that's your seed bed and that's your birthing place. And that's why you. Y'all been having too many miscarriages and why some of y'all go to the spiritual abortion clinic because you refuse to gird up with the belt of truth and you lose your baby. You lose your birth. Uh, your birthing place is not tightened up good enough. Your seed bed is not gird about with truth and so now you give birth to a lie or now you just don't give birth at all. Gird yourself up. Slap your neighbor and tell him gird up neighbor. Okay, I'm hurrying. I heard you. Verse 14. He says, sanctify you a fast. Oh, you don't want to hit me. You don't want me to hit that one. Sanctify me a fast. Mm. Do you know what fasting is? Fasting is a sign of spiritual hunger. <laughs> Talk about a tough crowd. I said fasting is a sign of spiritual hunger. Because when you fast, you want what he has more than what you have. I'm about ready to close my Bible and walk off of here. Fasting is a sign of your spiritual hunger. Because when you're hunger for what more for what he has than what you have, it shows him that your your level of desire is rising. Your level of desire and passion and pursuit and hunger for the things of God is rising. Fasting is not a weight loss program. Fasting is not dieting. Fasting is a sign of spiritual hunger when you tell God, God, I want what you have. I want what heaven has more than what I can provide for myself. I want the spiritual food more than I want bean and burger. I want the spiritual food more than I want salt grass steakhouse. I want you what you have more than what I can provide for myself. <laughs> he said, now call sanctify. Watch that word sanctify means separate. Separate me a fast. Watch this. Watch this. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 17, Jesus was, 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 was casting a devil out of a boy that his disciples couldn't cast him out. And the disciples said, well, Jesus, why couldn't we do that? He said, this kind, verse 21, this kind comes out only by prayer and... <laughs> this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. Before Dr. Lester Summerall went into Billy Bid Prison to cast the devil out of a woman inmate there, he fasted seven days. He said, I'm not going in there because they caught her. Man, she's, man she, she, she's full of devils. She's de demonically possessed. You got to go cast the devil out of her. He said, I will, but I'm not going to do it until I fast. Because the word of God says sometimes they only come out by prayer and fasting. And Dr. Summerall said, I'm not going in there until I have shown God and given him a sign that I want what he has more than what I can provide for myself. And when he got done fasting, he walked in Billy Bid prison in the Philippines and cast a devil out of the woman. And she got saved and 5,000 people came to Jesus in a revival in the middle of the city. Am I talking to anybody? Why? Because he separated and sanctified himself a fast. 
if you want it, fast for it. Fast for it. If it's hard to get, have you tried fasting? Moving right along. Chapter 2, verse number 1. Joel 2, verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord cometh for it is nigh at hand. Serious survival strategies. You with me? You need a plan of action. You need a strategy. Number one, you got to gird yourself. Prepper. Number two, you got to sanctify yourself. Number three, you need to blow the trumpet in Zion. What, what, what does that mean? You have to be the watchman on the wall. You have to be the one to let others know. Ezekiel 33 and 6. But if the watchman sees the sword come and blows not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he, the watchman, is taken away in his iniquity. But his blood, the watchman's blood, will I require at the watchman's hand. Now watch, 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 watch. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he's taken away. But his blood, the person that's taken, will be required at the hand of the watchman. Why? Because you didn't blow the trumpet. Because you didn't sound the alarm. Here's the truth. Listen to me. You may not like what I have to say, but I have to say it. It may make you uncomfortable. It may make you mad. It may frustrate you. It may make you angry. I don't know what it does to you. But I have to say it because I don't want your blood required in my hand. And I have to be the watchman. Are you hearing me, preachers? Where are all my preacher men at? Are y'all hearing me? You're a watchman on the wall. And if you do not blow the trumpet and you do not sound the alarm on judgment day, God said, I will require their blood at your hand. Matthew 25 and 6, and at midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom comes, go you out to meet him. A cry was made. It was only when the cry was made that the bridegroom was coming did the bride know that it was time to get up and meet him. If the cry is not made, the bride could very well miss the groom. Are y'all in here? There has to be watchmen on the wall. We cannot afford to let down our guard and not warn the people because the blood will be required at their hand, at your hand. Listen to me. Rend your heart. Verse number 13, chapter 2. Rend your heart and not your garments. I'm going to hurry. Rend your heart and not your garment because tearing your garment, ripping your garment was a sign of contrition. It was a sign of humility. God said this. He said, I would rather that you rend, tear your heart rather than your garment. What are you saying, God? Listen, the word rend means to tear or make an opening. Watch me. Tear or make an opening. If you do not tear, make an opening, he cannot have access. You have the power to give him access or deny him access. Behold, Revelation 3.20, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open I'll come in and sup with him and he with me if you do not rend if you do not tear if you do not make an opening he cannot have access listen to me restoration church if we do not make an opening for him he will not show up serious survival strategy how do you make it how are we going to make it through everything that's going on in the world today here we are make an opening for him rend your heart Last but not least, here we go. Verse 17. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare the people, O Lord. 
Give not your heritage your reproach, and the heathen shall rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? Again, he's talking to the priests, the leadership. And he says this. He said, I want you to weep between the porch and the altar. Watch this. The porch is outside. The altar is inside. He said the only way they can get from the outside to the inside is if you become the bridge. You have to become the bridge. Because they do not have access, they cannot come in from the outside to the inside unless you, priest, leadership, unless you become the bridge. Here's the deal. I'm closing with this. Here's the deal. Leadership, preachers, pastors, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, fourfold ministry office gift. Here's the deal. We have set ourselves up. Watch. Until we have become skyscrapers instead of bridges. Because now we say in order for you to have access to us, you got to go through 93 floors to the top of the skyscraper. Because I'm all that. And if you're going to get to me, you got to go through all these channels. But God said, priest, leadership, preacher, pastor, evangelist, here's what you really need to do. You need to stop trying to be a skyscraper and be, be a bridge. What does that mean? Let them walk on you. What do you do with a bridge? You rock over it. You drive over it. You lay yourself in the gap and you bridge the gap between the outside and the inside. Stop setting yourself up on your high horse and trying to be a skyscraper and lower yourself in the form of a servant and become the bridge for the lost and the dying. If you want to talk to Apostle so-and-so, then you got to get in touch with his people. And then his people will get in touch with your people. We have lost sight as leaders in the body of Christ. We have lost sight of what we're doing and what it's all about. And because we have failed to spiritually prep, the enemy has come in and rode roughshod over the entire land. Serious survival. You need a plan. Tell your neighbor, you need a plan. You need a prepping plan. There is only room enough in the top of the skyscraper for one. And you ain't it. You've heard it before, but I'm going to say it again in closing. If you're too good to serve, you're not good enough to lead. Stand with me. I'm done. Stand with me. Y'all ain't, ain't even listening to me. Father, I just pray right now. I pray that somewhere in this congregation that this word has found its mark. Somewhere, somebody. I pray, God, that it has found its mark. And I pray your Holy Spirit will drive this point home to your people. I pray that you would help us, God. To apply these strategies so that we can combat what the enemy is attempting to do to our land. An unprepared church is a defeated church. An unprepared Christian is a defeated Christian. 
And an unprepared nation is a defeated nation. Help us, God. Help us. Help us to stop trying to hide stuff. Help us to be okay with being uncomfortable. Help us to stop setting ourselves up as some puffed up preacher or prophet. Man, just be a servant. (laughs) Just be a servant. Lord, I love you. I thank you for this word. I pray that I've done it justice. In Jesus' name. Well, I know I'm going to prepare, start preparing. Woo! Mama. We prepare for everything else. COVID hit 2020. We were out buying up every piece of toilet paper we could find. So now let's prepare in the spiritual. Hunger night. Hunger night tonight, 6 p.m. Come in hungry. Come in expecting. Because if you come in expecting, you will receive. I, 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 I challenge you. I challenge you. Miss Deborah George, Saturday morning at 10 a.m. Just real quick by a show of hands. How many of you are planning to be here? Awesome, 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 awesome. Young ones, the young, a man, those kids are just amazing. And a lot of people will talk to a child that won't talk to an adult. So if you can bring the kids and, and we'll just make sure they're watched after. But okay, 10 o'clock Saturday, 10 o'clock Saturday here at the church. I believe that's it. Offering, tithes, offering, seed, give as you leave this morning. Give your tithe, your seed, your offering, and we love you. Be blessed. We will see you tonight at 6.